Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Essential Tremor virtual education event. Uh, today, we will be discussing coping techniques for essential tremor. My name is Patrick McCartney. I'm the executive director of the International Essential Tremor Foundation, and we thank you for joining us today. So before we get started, I would like to uh, say a quick thank you to our sponsors uh, for the event today. Thank you to uh, Medtronic, Abbott, Insitec, Sage Therapeutics, and Cala Health. Their support allows us to provide these webinars, our podcast series, and our quarterly ET education forums, and we really appreciate their support of the ET community. So I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Our speaker is Kelly Riling Ott, who is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Occupational Therapy at the University of Kansas Medical Center. A little bit about uh, Kelly. She's an experienced clinician who teaches courses in occupational therapy programs, such as analysis of occupations, assessment, intervention, and others. She has more than 20 years of experience working in various adult settings within the medical model, including acute hospitalization, skilled nursing facilities, and inpatient and outpatient rehabilitation. Kelly's outpatient experiences provide opportunities to expand the role of the occupational therapist in a medical model. These outpatient experiences include interprofessional clinic consultations for individuals with Parkinson's, muscular dystrophy, and ALS, seating and mobility assessments, and involvement in a community-based program for individuals with multiple sclerosis. She also currently provides clinical services in the School of Health Professions and Faculty Practice. She's a graduate of the University of Kansas in 1993 with a bachelor's degree and a uh, bachelor's degree in occupational therapy, and she earned her doctorate from KU in 2012. So, uh, Kelly, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. I'll let you share your screen and get started with your uh, presentation. Thank you, Patrick. And welcome everyone. I am looking forward to kind of sharing some information with you today. So as Patrick said, I am looking to really talk to you about uh, coping with the physical and emotional effects of essential tremor. Um, and just, I know that uh, Patrick had shared a little bit about me, so I'm gonna share a little bit more. Um, the reason for my compounded last name is that I was uh, Kelly Riling up until about two years ago when I got married and hence have now adopted the ought in my last name. So um, like Patrick shared is um, I have been uh, basically practicing for about 27 years and uh, my passion has always been working with individuals with um, um, basically neuromuscular and neurodegenerative disease. So um, I'm really happy to be here with you today. So um, just to kind of get started, I always like to share a little bit about what occupational therapy is. I know that um, I've been out and about for many years and um, every time I introduce myself, people will often associate occupational therapy with a, somebody who may be looking to help somebody find work. And um, I'm kind of gonna dispute that a little bit in that with occupational therapy, our primary focus is looking um, to help individuals engage in those activities they do throughout their day. So um, since the occupational therapy is anything that you do that occupies your time. So um, with occupational therapy, our huge focus is on participation. Um, so with that being said, we really want to engage with the individuals we work with on the things that they truly find meaningful in their lives and work to make that happen. So that's just kind of more a little bit about what occupational therapy is. Um, so like I said, participation is huge, engagement is huge, meaningful occupation is huge. And it really, I find all of those things are what we focus so much on as far as what um, do individuals feel um, helps them have a good quality of life. So a lot of what I do in my clinical role is to um, provide avenues to part, you know, increase that participation. Um, and in doing that, a huge part of my role is on the education process as far as giving people the resources they need 
um, because I feel like education is empowerment and it's not, I don't always want it to be that you feel that um, you would have to rely on someone else in order to do something. So I um, really do my best to provide those resources to the individuals I work with. So then that way um, they've got the tools in moving forward. Okay. So the objectives that um, pretty much I have for this presentation are I really kind of want to go through some of the literature to talk about some of the non-pharmacological and non-surgical interventions um, that have been used in therapy practices to um, address essential tremor. Um, and in doing that, we're going to discuss a lot of the evidence and those interventions that have been supported and those that maybe are still kind of, um, you know, maybe done, but maybe not as effective. And then um, we will take some time to talk about um, how we can go about modifying the task to make things easier and look at um, coping strategies. So uh, just kind of the lead in to those um, interventions and research to give you some background, I went through the literature, and so a lot of the findings that I'm going to present to you are based on a systematic review that was done in 2011. And um, just to give you an idea of what a systematic review is, is it's where um, individuals go through the literature and they really analyze systematically what are the findings from literature to see what interventions can truly be supported by the evidence. And so I'm gonna kind of go through and give you some highlights, um, just more of having that information so you can make informed decisions. So um, one of the interventions that was identified in the systematic review was a tremor suppressing orthotic or orthoses. And that being that there were three devices that were looked at. Um, one was a writing device and two were more what we call exoskeletal devices. And to describe just what an exoskeletal device is, it almost looks like a splint that basically encapsulates the forearm. Um, a lot of the exoskeletal devices um, used weighted type of approaches where they would have strategically positioned weights. And the idea was to, um, with the weighted devices, or if there was maybe more anti-tremor kinds of um, um, an orthotic there, it was to suppress the tremor in order to um, allow an individual to participate in a functional activity. So with these um, particular studies, a lot of the activities that were addressed were handwriting because that has been um, a problem that's been identified. And what they were finding overall is that with these particular devices, there was improvement However, the improvement was not long lasting. It basically was improvement only while the orthotic was in place. And so um, always in an intervention that's being recommended, you um, or what we hope is that individuals are finding from the individuals using that intervention, kind of what was that feedback. And um, some of the feedback that was identified related to these particular orthotics was that the Orthotics were often costly to obtain, um, not so readily available to all. Um, one of the orthotics that was actually studied um, has been discontinued altogether. And um, the orthotics in general were pretty bulky in nature. And so individuals, you know, what we had shared is they were effective when wearing. Individuals were less likely to want to wear them outside the home. So um, hence, only effective when wearing. So yeah, so that was one of the interventions studied. The next was a strength training program. And for this particular study, it was very interesting in that when we think of strength training programs, we look at things globally. But for this particular study, they looked at the index finger alone. And so what it was is that they had a um, strengthening program for the index finger that was completed over a four week um, duration. Um, and the, the hope was the outcome was to maintain the index finger steady for one minute. 
And so some of the secondary measures that they looked at were um, the drawing of the spiral, holding breakers or beakers of water as far as being able to make control there, that kind of thing. And then they also had individuals complete a questionnaire of activities of daily living. And um, basically the outcome of that particular study related to the index finger was that strength improvement was reported. However, there wasn't carryover as far as increased strength leading to decreased tremor. So that was the outcome of that particular study. The next was on limb cooling. And basically with this particular intervention, the individual would immerse their hand into a bucket of water that was 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit and maintain it in the bucket of water for five minutes. Um, after removal, um, measurements were taken one minute after and then every five minutes for up to 30, uh, 30 minute period. And the measure that they used outside of in the timing, they had individuals participate in a hand function assessment, which is known as the Jepson Taylor test of hand function. And just to give you a little bit of background about that assessment, it looks at seven. Um, subtests. And one of the subtests is related to handwriting. Another is um, basically a simulated self-feeding assessment. Uh, there is an assessment related to card turning. Um, there is another that looks at picking up small objects, stacking objects, picking up non-weighted items, and also picking up weighted items are um, just kind of the sampling of the subtests. And basically what they found is that tremor was reduced in response to the immersion in the cold water. And what they were finding is the cooler the temperature, the more the tremor was suppressed. However, what they didn't do was look at the, the long-term effect beyond that 30 minute period. So um, that just kind of gives you a little bit about the limb cooling intervention. The next, um, and I've seen this used some, um, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how it's used presently, is the use of functional electrical stimulation. And in a clinical environment, um, oftentimes functional electrical stimulation will be where the therapist will position electrodes that basically are hooked to a little battery operated current that will send a signal to peripheral nerves. Oftentimes, um, the functional electrical stimulation used in the clinical setting is to see if a muscle response can be generated. For this particular instance, it was used to see if um, trigger to the response would calm the peripheral nerves responsible in the tremor. And so um, what they were finding is that um, when it was applied, um, it was effective, however, long-term effects were not recorded for this particular study. And the other instance that needs to be mentioned is that when using the functional electrical stimulation for these particular studies, they didn't consider any functional measures as far as how could the individual use um, the arm to handwrite or those kinds of things. So that really wasn't looked at. Now, since this study, because I like preface in that these were all done in 2011, um, Calahealth has brought out a device called Calatrio that basically uses a similar principle in the sense of peripheral nerve stimulation as a mechanism of suppression of the tremor. And just to kind of give you a little bit of background in what has been happening there is so it is like it's a device that looks more like a wrist or a wristwatch, like more like an Apple watch. And in wearing it for um, 40 minutes twice a day, what they have found is that individuals have reported up to an hour and a half of tremor suppression that um, leads to more engagement in activities. So that's just 
um, kind of something that's out there. Um, they found that about 62% uh, of the individuals that were involved in their study, which um, basically there were over 200, did find that they did have some trauma reduction associated with um, the use of that device. So that is just kind of one of the things that's out there. So something more current as opposed to the study that was done in 2011. The next um, intervention that I'm going to talk about is vibration therapy. And so they used two different approaches when they were um, with the systemic or a systematic review. Uh, one was actual use of like a vibration wand that was directly applied to um, the forearm and the other was whole body vibration. Um, and what they were finding is that they're in response to the vibration um, or, and I, I should kind of back up a little bit. Basically, they did the application for 10 minutes and then allowed 10 minutes of rest. And so in response to the application of vibration, they did find a um, reduced amplitude and tremor. However, they did not uh, record how long that reduced amplitude um, lasted. So. Um, that was kind of just a little bit about the vibration therapy. And then limb weights, um, and that um, was a, is another intervention. And this is the one I think is probably most commonly used in a lot of clinical environments. Um, with this particular one, individuals um, were able to determine how much weight they wanted to apply. Oftentimes with the limb weights, they're um, basically cuff weights that are um, applied at the wrist and uh, then individuals wear the weights and engage in activities. And for this particular study, there were 50 individuals that participated and 29 of those individuals reported improvement. I will um, kind of highlight that with this particular study, this, the systematic review was looking at individuals with tremor, but it wasn't, um, all studies were not focused specifically on individuals with essential tremor. So for this particular study, there were individuals that had MS and also individuals that had Parkinson's disease. So the individuals with MS or intention tremor were the ones that um, reported benefit. Individuals with Parkinson's disease did not benefit, which for me, because oftentimes the tremor associated with an individual with Parkinson's disease is at rest, so I'm not exactly certain why they were looking at weighting the limb, but um, that is probably one of the reasons why it was not effective. So yeah, so that is um, just kind of one of the highlights. Also to note that um, 12 individuals that were involved in this study that had been followed for a six month period following completion of the study, continue to report improvement in regards to limb weight. Okay. The next intervention I'd like to highlight is the bright light therapy intervention. And basically this intervention was looking at suppressing melatonin production to see if it would help with tremor reduction. Individuals that participated uh, did the bright light therapy for 14 days. And basically the outcome of it was that there was a very small um, effect on tremor reduction reported by the individuals who participated. So uh, basically further investigation is needed for this intervention. And then the last intervention I'm gonna to talk to you about is the transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, this was done over a consecutive four-day period and looking to see with this type of intervention if there was any effect on tremor. Um, basically, what they found is that there was no improvement reported, so not considered effective in nature. Okay. And so um, what I also want to note is that for all of the interventions that were done, the individuals that participated or all the participants um, never discontinued any medication. So they were taking their medications throughout the um, study period, okay? So you're probably asking, 
what does all of this mean? And basically the takeaway is that there is not one intervention that works for all. We are unique individuals and we have very unique needs. And so um, it's really easy, especially when some new interventions come out to want to be an early adopter. And, and, and basically it's, it's what I want as an occupational therapist is sometimes I think what we need to look is not at trying to fix the person, but let's see how we can make the task work for the person. So there's a great quote that I really wanna share, and it's by an occupational therapist. Um, her name is Karen Manzer, and this is the quote. The person is not inadequate for a task. The task is inadequate for the person. So the takeaway I have from that particular quote is, what as an occupational therapist can I do to really make things easier for individuals? So the next series, um, we're going to talk about how can we make a task easier to do? So really there are five key principles. So um, that being said, depending on what's going on, things to always consider in making a task easier is, are there ways to stabilize the object involved? How can we reduce the demand of the task? How can we conserve some of the energy? And when I say energy, more of muscle energy. What are ways we can promote success? And are there ways that we can use technology to our advantage? So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on each of these. So useful techniques for all is that, um, when wanting to participate, the key is always proper body mechanics. And the reason I say that is so often when we let body mechanics go to the wayside, other muscles are doing the work. And so when trying to do things, we've got to do things more efficiently. And the way to do that is always to maintain proper body mechanics. Always look at ways to keep that core stable because unless we have a stable core, it is very challenging to try to use our arms and our legs because movement of arms and legs is very reliant on a stable core. Other things and, um, to make things easier is um, to help is always make sure those elbows are supported to help give you some stabilization. So it's kind of going back to overall stability. So when supporting elbows, you can think about placing them on the table. So this is where we're growing up when mom said no, no elbows on the table, doesn't apply here. Um, allowing them to rest on countertops, armrests, um, and also the other thing to think about, if needed, use one hand to support the other in doing um, the things that you're wanting to do. So here are just some um, things that can help in stabilizing objects. So things that we look at are non-skid surfaces, um, mounting tools, suction cups, and clipboards. So in the world of occupational therapy, there are gadgets, and we refer to those gadgets as adaptive equipment. And there is a lot of them, so much so that it used to be when I was first in practice, you would typically have to go to a company to order this equipment. And now I'm finding that it's readily available everywhere. So what you're seeing in the upper um, left hand um, photo, the plate is actually on a piece of what it looks like a little bit of rubberish shiny material. That is actually known as Dysum. The Dysum is a non-skid surface and it has quite a stick to it. You can also do that same thing with the non-skid material that people often use to line their shelves at home. Um, I will say that the Dyson product is probably a little bit stickier than shelf liner or stickier than shelf lining, but um, it's shelf lining is much cheaper. Um, using clipboards to stabilize papers. Um, also, you're seeing up there is um, they have. Um, a denture, this is a particular denture brush, but it has suction cups on it. So using like suction cups to help secure things in a sink, if it makes things easier, whatever you're doing, 
Um, they even have, I think, cutting boards that um, are suction cut that you can suction cut to the counter. So yeah, but sometimes the cutting boards with the weight that they are don't necessarily always require suction cuts. So yeah, but just that's how there's some items to help stabilize. Then as far as reducing demand, um, this is where we can really use like um, Velcro closures instead of uh, tying up shoes. There are also such things as elastic shoelaces. Granted, sometimes they do make it a little bit harder to put the shoe on, but Velcro closures, or even now, so many options are slip-on. Um, having lever handles instead of the round knobs, use of weighted pins or even the built-up pins, which will um, allow more extension at the fingers and not um, fatigue out the hands so much. Using hooks and pulls and those kinds of things um, as far as um, in helping to do the task. So all options. And then as far as conserving energy, I feel always remember to take rest breaks. Don't feel like you have to push yourself through the task. And that is so um, relevant in that oftentimes if our body is telling us it's time to rest and we're trying to push through, fatigue becomes a factor and tremor will become worse. If there are times where you can sit versus stand to do a task, such as, and I, you know, one of the ones that um, people will tell me about is when they're cutting up a lot of vegetables while standing at the counter, I'll often ask, do you have a bar stool or something that you can kind of sit on while you're doing that um, to help as far as stabilize the core? Um, use the countertops or things to your advantage. So if you're working with a heavy pot that you're coming off or yeah, taking off the stove, if you can use the counter to slide across and, and use that instead of trying to carry, um, those are all different ways to conserve energy. And then as far as promoting success, um, use the equipment to your advantage in the sense that with glasses, if maintaining steadiness is a challenge, use a glass with a lid. So then that way it'll prevent spills there are things and what you're seeing on the, the left-hand photo is that they have plate guards that will help in scooping up items, uh, using finger foods instead of um, the use of the silverware, that kind of thing. So those are all ways to promote success. And then of course, technology. So that is where instead of hand mixing, there are electric mixers available electric can, oper can openers versus the manual, electric toothbrushes, um, and even some of the adaptive keyboards. I know a lot of individuals have talked about how they will hit numerous keys, and there is um, basically key guards that will help direct what key um, can be hit. Also, um, what you're seeing there too is there is um, the liftware study is a spoon that's out that also has several attachments that you can do um, a fork as well. And the idea behind it is it has anti-tremor software in it. So it reads the tremor and basically works in the opposite direction to maintain the item on the spoon. And then of course there, instead of texting, there's always the option of doing voice as well. So that's the ability to use technology too. Okay, and I've shown a lot of um, things that really are specific to the adaptive equipment, that kind of thing, but I also want to highlight that uh, there are a lot of household items that can be used too. So in lieu of buying weighted this or weighted that, you can use washer and bolts to help weight things down. Um, in lieu of having to do or obtain um, a zipper pull device, you can use a paper clip that makes it easier. And then of course, I had already kind of shared with you about the use of the shelf liner as a non-skid option versus having to go out and buy the Dyson option. And then as far as coping strategies, um, 
the thing I would like to share is always uh, take advantage of every opportunity to educate yourself. So being a part of this presentation today is one of those options. Explore resources. Um, like I said, there are a lot of things that are readily available out there um, as far as different types of utensils, those kinds of things. So always take advantage of that. Um, create awareness. Um, oftentimes, I think this sometimes makes um, people a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and I, when I'm working with individuals in clinic, I will encourage them to kind of explain the situation to others and make others aware of what's going on um, as a way to um, basically help in the coping. Because oftentimes people will tell me, I feel like people are looking at me and thinking this or that. And that's where I'm always encouraging them to be open and honest um, and, and create that awareness. Also, I um, really encourage opportunities to um, reduce stress because what we know is stress will make things worse and make the tremor worse. And so always take time for self. And I know, especially in this environment with a pandemic, um, it seems like stress is at levels that we haven't experienced before. And so always give yourself permission to take time for you and do what's needed for you. So really consider incorporating relaxation strategies into your daily routine. I um, have really been encouraging individuals to take time out to engage in mindfulness activities. Um, and some of them are, can be as easy as an app on the phone where it just has you uh, basically work on breathing types of activities and just thinking in the moment and not thinking about yesterday, tomorrow, and 15 minutes from now. Just think about now and give yourself time to just be one with life right now. Um, also, there's the opportunities to join a support group. And I find um, when I have talked with individuals in the support groups, they are so great at having resources to share. And so um, that is just, I would totally encourage that. And then always, like what I've been saying all along, just engage in those things that are meaningful to you. Do what you need for yourself. And I find as far as the physical, always take time to engage in activity. I think just overall keeping our bodies in good condition is basically the best thing that we can do for ourselves. And, and I'm, I know social activity looks very different right now, but be with the people that are um, so important to you. And then these are the references I have. So thank you very much for being a part of the presentation today. Great, thank you, uh, Kelly. Uh, thanks for speaking with us today. We appreciate you joining us and sharing all these coping techniques for essential tremor. Uh, hopefully you found this presentation helpful and uh, found out something new maybe you didn't know today. Um, just wanted to share a little information here with you. If you have any questions regarding essential tremor, please visit the IETF website at essentialtremor.org or you can call us toll free at 888-387-3667 and all that information is up on the screen right now to share with you. And finally, if you are a donor to the IETF, we thank you for your support. If you aren't currently donating, uh, please consider a gift. It'll help us continue the work we do promoting ET awareness, education, support, and research. So we plan on hosting a variety of virtual ET education events in the upcoming months, including some po new podcasts. So look for these notices about these events in your email, our social media channels, our Tremor Talk magazine, and on our website. And uh, we'll keep you updated on what those topics are and when they're going to be uh, up for folks to see and listen to. So thank you again for joining us and have a great day.